Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are playwright Wendy Graff and filmmaker Hago Gusuzian. Award-winning playwright Wendy Graff was born and raised in Pacific Palisades, where she still lives. She went to Palisades High. Uh, graduated from UCLA and is a member of Theater West Ensemble, uh, Theater West Ensemble Studio. Theater. Theater, <laughs> right, and the Actors Studio in the, in the playwriting part. Uh, she's written lots of plays which have been produced on the LA stages and Wendy, tell us how you got interested in writing. Oh, well, I was always a writer. I was always, always a writer. <laughs> um, I actually started out being an actress, well, thinking I was an actress and wanting to be an actress. And when I went to college, my mo I wanted to be a theater major. My mother said, can you sing like Judy Garland? Can you dance like Eleanor Powell? No. Then forget it. Well, that was very <laughs> encouraging. <laughs> can you make a living like <laughs> That's the story of my life. Now, um, so I, I got into other things, and I got into teaching, and kind of ended up saying, what am I doing teaching? And then I started kind of going back and taking classes at UCLA um, in, in um, acting and directing and um, you but know, why did you do it. this? Why didn't you just go to novels? Why didn't you write novels or screenplays? You have written screenplays, I know. I, I have mean. written screenplays. I didn't write. I'm not a narrative writer. My, oh. I tell my story through dialogue. That's my metier. That's what oh. I, how I found it. That's interesting because I couldn't tell a story through dialogue. I would have to write it a, a different right. way. And I always thought that they were so much alike, and I didn't know what was wrong. Why couldn't I do that? <laughs> but now you're telling me as a teacher that you can't do that, right? No, you can't. I mean, it's through plays. It's, it's totally a dialogue-based medium. I'm, I'm not a narrative writer at all. But screenplays are dialogue-based, wouldn't they be? Screenplays are more visually based. They're like pictures. Um, I wasn't a very successful screenplay writer. <laughs> I, I did have a career in television, and then I wrote a lot of screenplays that never got made. So I was not oh, a very that right? successful screenplay writer. But you have, your plays have gotten a lot of, of, uh, of notoriety. Yeah. I mean, Gordon Davidson directing Lessons is yeah. like probably the top of the line, isn't it? Um, it was <laughs> absolutely a wonderful experience and he's, he's a very, very important person to me. He's, I really consider him my mentor, and it, oh. it was a wonderful relationship, still ongoing. And s actually, so much of the work that we did in lessons that I learned from him has spilled over into this new play, Behind the Gates. Tell us what Lessons was about. Lessons was about um, a rabbi, a female rabbi, who took her daughter, her 13-year-old daughter, to Israel to celebrate her bat mitzvah and the daughter walked into a yogurt store and the yogurt store was blown up. Oh. So th that's the backstory. So it opens up as she's, for two years, she's given up her faith. She doesn't believe in God. She's, you know, she, her marriage ended and um, she's really withdrawn from the world. Where did they produce that? It was produced, well, it was actually produced twice. It was produced one, both times at the Marilyn Monroe Theater at the group at Strasbourg. Oh, right. And the first <laughs> time, actually, Adam Davidson, who's Gordon's son, yes. directed it. Oh, he did? Oh, yeah. I remember when he was doing that. He's yeah. turned out to be a fantastic director. He is a fantastic director. I guess he has the genes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a good filmmaker, too. Yeah. Excellent. Well, he won an Academy Award for a short film yes. just right out of college. I know. So we can say he was a good uh, filmmaker, right? right? And he continues that. Um, 
How did Gordon decide to choose that? Well, what happened was Adam, Adam directed it, and we worked on it for quite a long time. And we had a wonderful production with Mayor Winningham and Hal Linden. <laughs> and halfway through the sold-out run, there was a tragedy in Mayor's family. Oh. And we had to shut down. Oh, so then you revived it? Well, what happened was I went on to do another play, Leipzig, which was my play that won all these awards. Many and awards. And I, in fact, I just got back from Bloomington, Indiana on Friday, they did a production of it. I want to talk about yeah. Leipzig too. Finish the story okay, about so, then Gordon so coming in. So I put in. it away and you know moved on. So I thought, and then um, a you know a couple of years later, the producing entity called me and said we'd like to bring it back. You know we feel oh. like so many people didn't get to see it, etc. And I said. Um, well, you know, we talked about it and everything. We talked, you know, about Adam, and Adam was really very busy in television at the time. So Adam called me and he said, "What would you think of my father directing it?" <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, he Gordon was actually he he spent a lot of time with us um, when you were first? when I was working with Adam, you know, and he uh, he was at the still at, um, with Center Theater Group at the time, and he he gave us the Douglas to rehearse in. Oh, and, that was great. You know, great. it was really wonderful. So he was familiar with the script, and I said, "Well, has he read the new script?" And Adam said, "I'm going to send it to him." So he sent it to him, and then I got this call one day. Hello, Wendy. This is Gordon Davidson. I'm excited about the possibilities. So that's and, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That was fantastic. Tell us what Leipzig was about because it did win many awards. Leipzig, what, again, um, was from my background, uh, from my own experience. Leipzig was the story of a woman who, was, well, as a child in 1938, she was sent out of Leipzig, Germany on a kinder transport. Oh. And she was sent to live. This is all backstory. She was sent to live with her governess in Boston, who was an American. She was an American, and until the trouble was over, well, her whole family perished, and they brought her up and they said, "You're our daughter now. This never happened. You're American," and we wiped out the whole story. So when the play opens, she's in her 70s, and she has a daughter who's in her oh. 50s. And she has Alzheimer's, and she has a small accident, and she's in the hospital, and she begins to pray in Hebrew, and nobody ever knew about this. Oh, I see. And they came back to her. Yes, I and see. the daughter um, was like, "Oh my God, she's stunned." And then the play is actually a search. It was based on the question, "What if you had a secret you, all your life you tried to forget, yes. and now?" You tried to remember before it was too late. Yes, isn't that so? Such a, a poignant thing because it happens to people. Yeah, and it is a true thing. Um, so far, we have lessons, Israel. Yeah. We have Leipzig, out of Israel. We have <laughs> the Book of Esther, which has to be yeah. something about that. What was that play about? That play was about a woman finding her. Jewish identity. So, and then we have um, all the we have behind the gates, <laughs> but all of these covered the different facets of Israel, of Judaism, of of personal journey. Well, that's what I write about. In fact, they asked me to write my writer's notes for behind the gates, and I said once again, I'm writing of home, of faith, of family, of identity. I just keep going back to it. The, uh, you started writing Behind the Gates, which is your newest play, or your last mm -hmm. newest play, start, which was in 2008. Well, after a trip to Israel in 2008. Was that your first trip? It was my first trip. I, how could you be writing all of this stuff and never get to Israel till this last play? Well, it was funny because, you know, so, so long with my kids, it, I'd say, let's go to Israel this year, and everybody would be like, nah, we don't want to go to Israel, or, you know, then, oh, it's too dangerous, oh, it's too right. this, oh, it's too that. So finally, in 2008, I said to my husband, you know, forget the kids, let's just you and I go. <laughs> oh, so you did do and that. And he had been, he had been, um, like, with a backpack right after college years ago, yeah. but I had never been. 
So, so did you find what you were writing was actually happening there? Well, the play came out of my. But visit. I mean, I on the other, the other, uh, other plays that you wrote. I mean, so much of it was based on different feelings that had to have come out of Israel. There's some. Do you know what Jerusalem fever is? No, but I love Jerusalem. (laughs) (laughs) There, there's a there's a syndrome that, and I found this out much later. That's known as Jerusalem fever, and it's been reported for for hundreds of years that people who go to Jerusalem that there's so much fervor and vibrations in this city around so many holy sites that you just kind of, you know, all kinds of things happen to you. And that's what happened to me. Well, you can't really, it's a clash of cultures. It's just like so much going on. But you you don't feel any danger. No, not at all. And I was actually there the week, I was just, I was in the hotel right down the street where the guy with the steamroller rolled over somewhere. But you don't feel any danger, but you feel so many strong emotions. And I was just so overcome with, with you know, I'd start crying or I'd feel fury and rage or I'd feel despair and I'd feel hope and I'd feel, this is so beautiful and I'd feel love. And You're, you're, um, you're capturing that in your play because one of the things after the play, you're going to have discussions yes. with uh, women's issues, with what else? Um, well, we're having, we, we have a, an association with the Levantine Center. Yes, that's fantastic. Yeah, 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 they're great. And we have two planned discussions with them. One is about women in um, conservative religions. Because, I mean, I chose Israel and I chose Judaism only because I knew it. But it's just a metaphor. It's a metaphor for fundamental Islam. It's a metaphor <laughs> for evangelicals. It's a metaphor for fundamental Mormonism. It's a metaphor for any fundamental religion. So any one of these plays could be about any, any one of us. Well, cert- yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, Leipzig, the two characters, the two main characters are Catholic. And then they find out they have a Jewish background. So it's really, it's more about family, and a family's coming of age, and a family's finding their identity. Did you, did you uh, research, did you talk to people who had these kind of issues? Or did you just make them up? Or did you read about them? How did you get the inspiration for the characters? Um, <laughs> well, it started Madeline with Albright. the young. Madeline Albright. Madeline oh, Albright well, started that was Jewish. For Leipzig. Became, that, yeah. For Leipzig, what happened was. Oh, it was at that time? That was Leipzig. What happened was it was two things. One, I was invited to speak at a women's playwriting, a women's group that had playwriting. And they said, and I was waiting my turn, and, <laughs> and they said, do we have any past business? And this woman raised her hand and she said, I just got back from Leipzig, Germany, with my mother who had been invited by the German government. Apparently the German government has some program where they invite back expellees to come oh, back yeah. for two weeks. and. Let us show you the town and show you we're not so bad after all, right. I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway I, I, I started talking to her and I said, tell me about your mother. You know, and she said, let me put you in touch with my mother. So I uh-huh. went out and talked to her and she told me all her stories. And then she said, if you really want to hear some interesting stories, you should talk to my friend Ava Weisborg who is the person that I named the character after. Oh. And she told me these fascinating stories about how her father was this prominent physician and Martin Buber came to the house, but he had terrible table manners and they <laughs> smuggled her father out of into Czechoslovakia in a coffin and everything. So I started writing it very, very linearly and it, it didn't go anywhere. Oh. So I put it aside for a long time and then my mother-in-law contracted Alzheimer's, or oh, got so, Alzheimer's. Oh, so. And I was out with her at the beginning of her illness, and she said to me, what a strange disease this is. I can, I can remember things from so long ago, but I can't remember the right word or where my keys are, anything. And all of a sudden I went, that was it. So that's how you, you, a writer is always looking for something. Always, yes, always. yes. <laughs> well, we, we're very excited about Behind the Gates because I think that is going to tell us 
tell us everything and also this idea of women's issues which you'll be discussing after the uh, play so thank you thank you thank you pleasure. Wendy and thanks for watching this part of our show we have a visiting filmmaker from cadet from <laughs> from Canada hog up good Susian next <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with filmmaker Agop Guzuzian, who was born in Egypt and lives in Toronto. Working with TV Ontario, he's produced and directed several TV series, including Dossier's Three X's, a concert series. He created a series uh, called Un Autre Sens de Cloche. Oh. Un autre son de cloche in 1991, and he, award, and he won the Award of Merit for Children's Broadcasting for Nouvelle Nouvelle. So you've won a lot of awards, and you, <laughs> you've also written the Armenian Trilogy. So let's, let's start with your TV work and work up to your film work. Um, were you schooled particularly in film? Well... I wasn't necessarily schooled, but my schooling was my father. Ah, my like father, an apprentice? <laughs> I was his apprentice, and I learned from him. And, you know, as a matter of fact, when I was a child, uh, maybe six, seven years old, he would bring me f strips of film to what play did, with. What did he do? He was a filmmaker as well. He was. So yeah. what kind of films was he making? Well, he did documentaries, dramas, and he had, we had a studio in Cairo, and he did oh. commercials as well, oh, in which I appeared in some. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So you were in Cairo, you were being raised in, in Cairo. Cairo. Yeah. And, yeah. And do you remember? Have you been back? It's, it's very vague. I haven't ba been back. I'd like to go someday because it's a beautiful country. Oh, it's fantastic. The, talking about working with your father when you were a child, you work with a lot of children because uh, you started that do dossier? Toisix. Uh, the first Toisix. one, uh, Toisix, triple X, uh -huh. which, which means, means uh, exploration. Uh, it was a oh. scientific, uh, oh. how it, was, it's a, it was about scientific analysis. The triple X files were uh, the exploration and two other words, which is, I can't remember right now. But it was about, we were taking kids who had a passion of uh, doing scientific experiments and following through with them on their discoveries from the DNA to uh, at the MRA. Well, how did you really focus in on working with children? Well, uh, because most of that work in TV is, is child oriented yeah. or teenage oriented or young adult. For me, it was a passion because I felt I was doing something meaningful. And uh, when children would <coughs> look at it, they would also be encouraged to be partake in these experiments on their own. So ultimately, oh. <laughs> this was the objective to inspire and encourage other children. That's interesting because KCET did a, a series on science, which also brought children into doing the experiments and right. one experiment leading to another at a very, for very young children. Um, you also own Autre Son de Cloche. Well, that was that? An autre son, another uh, ring of the bell, which means another oh, way cloche. of looking at things. Ah. And they were uh, plays written by school kids. That's what was so great. Yeah. How did you choose those? How did you know what to do? Well, they, it, you see, when a subject comes from a kid's heart, it never fails. It's always successful. It's fantastic. Yeah. And um, um, Nouvelle Nouvelle, you got big awards on that. It was very successful. We did 92 episodes. Can you imagine? Yeah. And you were directing and producing? I, that's right. I was the producer, director, and we would, I had researchers who would find kids with uh, fascinating hobbies. Oh, that's how you did it. Yeah. And you continued, obviously. And one led to the other, and we went deeper and deeper into the shows. So far away from this TV and this children's involvement, comes your film. You, you go to Armenia and you 
produce and direct a trilogy. Tell us about that. Well, I think it began with the Karabakh War. Which was in the 80s? That's right. I think it crystallized my uh, inner emotions about my identity. And it was then that I realized that these people had a vision that was so clear about defending their homeland. About that part of it. But you were in Canada, right? That's right. Totally isolated. Been, totally isolated. You'd never been to Armenia before. Never. And it, was, and it touched you that much that you um, had, to, had to make this film. That's right. And that was the beginning. And then in, again with the independence of Armenia, I said, now I have to do something. Oh, so the first one was Armenian Exile. That That's was right. you, exiled or not? Well, you see, the original title, I, was, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I felt uh, it, there were a lot of Armenian poetry called Pantucht, uh, Vagabond. But that, did not, that had a derogatory translation uh, into English. Because it's the vagabond, the person who's okay. always traveling, always removed from his home, away from his home. So that concept evolved into exile, because in effect, the uh, vagabond is in exile. We right, are in exile right. from, our, from the homeland. And then, so what, what form did that first film take? Well, it was uh, a totally spontaneous film. Uh, it, uh, it, the stories unfolded on a daily basis in my j journeys throughout Armenia. Were you filming the whole time? Every day, every day, nonstop. You didn't have a script then? No. Or did you? No, no script? No. Then how do you put a story together, no script, working I, like that? The story is inside me. Mm -hmm. And instinctively, instinctively, I know what I'm doing, and I have a oh, focus. I it's, see. Uh, it's, so basically, I follow that thread, and wherever I'm going, I meet the people that happen. That fit into your <laughs> my story. <laughs> that fit into your story. Yeah. So tell us how long was it, and, and what kind of budget, and where did you edit it? Well, up until the point, I, I, I had never edited a film on my own. As a film producer, director, I've always had editors to work with. I see. So in TV, you were producing, and someone was uh, physically, professional was physically editing. I so in, with Armenian <laughs> Exile, I decided I'm going to do everything. So and the technology was ready for you know. To yeah, it was getting easier, wasn't it? That's right. <laughs> you didn't have to. But I didn't know what to do. I just didn't know what to do. I mean, it, it's all there. I have it in there. But how do you cut? How do you dissolve? I have never done it oh, before. Right. So I had to go through a. <laughs> Major learning curve. Did you learn on on the site? You didn't go to workshops or anything. Well, it's similar to workshops, but I did it through uh, train, video training courses. Oh, I see. Where I would reopen the file, th that course, and look at it. Because it had changed a lot from the workshop period, or from when you were working with your father. That's right. It's totally total different. Total evolution. Yeah. And it, uh, it's a switch from film to video. So you made the whole thing yourself. Absolutely, yeah. And it was an exciting process because when, by the time we were, uh, we were done, I realized now there's a question about music. How do I do the music? Oh, I was going to ask you about that, yeah. Well, I had never done music in my life before. I mean, you know, it's, uh, my son is very talented in music. So we, one of the most inspiring musical uh, church songs is Der Vormia. And I would ask my son to play variations of it uh -huh. and through uh, mu uh, various electronic instruments. I recreated that and came up with various versions throughout the so film. So you created the music as well That's from right. old folk and church music. Exactly. Then, then let's get to My Son Shall Be Armenian. Not the son you're talking about. It's, it's my same son. That's it is right. the son you're talking about. That's right. He's I was thinking maybe it was a... a film that your father was saying, my son, you, Hagop, would be right. Armenian, but it's you. Yeah, about my son being Armenian. And your son's name? Is Aruz. Aruz. Which means lion. Oh, so he's like... It was an empowerment. We gave him that name to empower him, to give him the strength. Ah, so, so let's get to the second film then. Uh, the second film, the, My Son Shall Be Armenian, was presented to the National Film Board of Canada with about 14 lines. 
and they loved the, the, the concept of it. It was just began as a concept, oh, and over a period of several years, it developed. The original idea was to go to Syria and redo the deportation march. Oh, we were really? going to walk from Derzor to Shedade. We went to Syria, surveyed, we had all the okays, and then we came back to Canada. We met the government people and came back to Canada and started preparing to leave for the shoot two days before. So it was a genocide film. That's right. So, But two days before it was canceled. Because, they, they, did they know it was a genocide film yeah, when you they started? Knew what, because everybody in Syria knows what happened. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no surprise. They all know what happened. Yeah. But then how did it get canceled? By the Syrian government? Yeah. No, yeah. And because they were probably pressured by the Turkish government? I don't know the details. Or the, some government, right? Yeah, they, had yeah. to, they had to, uh, so what happened then? Well, at that <laughs> point, the film was over. Mm -hmm. And my executive producer said, you know, you have two days. Can you come up with another idea about the genocide? So at that late, it was a Tuesday. I remember oh, very clearly. So the money was there. If we did, I didn't use that money. It was going to go to another director doing a film on something else. So I tried my best, went home, did studies, or looked over my research papers, and I think I came out with something. This is my son. Uh, my son, Shelby Armenia. And the idea was that five people, again, leave together. But this time, we go to Armenia looking for the survivors of the genocide. So it was a different. And then you had to get interviews. You interviewed. Did you find survivors? We found survivors. And all, there were also cases that we would arrive to the village. And the person died that day oh, or the we, day before. It was, it was a very touching uh, situation. And did you record that in your... Oh, it's, it's there. It's yes. all recorded. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's in the film. And then what about the music for this? That, uh, the music for that was done by an L.A. person, Ararat Petrosian. Oh, oh he's the uh, dudukist. Oh, so you have the Duduk, which is right. a wonderful... Right, so he's created the music, and he had other people get involved with him. He's an extremely talented uh, musician. And so he took over and did the music for this, this piece. Right. This is the piece that's going to be shown. Uh, both pieces will be shown on that's KCET, right. on our Saturday, public... That's right. Our public television, and I'm sure that those public televisions share with different public television stations, and it'll be shown all over the United States, especially on April 24th, which is the day that the Armenians commemorate, commemorate. the Armenian genocide. Yes. Um, and how long are you going to be here from Canada? Oh, I'm leaving on Sunday. I, uh, after the uh, airing of the two shows, uh, I leave uh, Sunday morning. Before we, before we leave, I know you're a professional photographer. You had shows in Quebec at the National Bibliothèque. Yes. And um, many galleries throughout Canada. That's right. And what kind of photographs? Well, again, uh, there were many that were of children. Oh, uh, children. So we've gotten the whole circle today. That's right. There's a... Uh, they're very touching, their innocence, uh, and the dreams they have is uh, just so present. P portraiture? That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm so glad that you, that you showed from TV to film to f photography. So it's all encompassed. That's right. Anything else you want to say? Uh, no, I think... Uh, I think we did well. We did well. <laughs> I think we did very well. And thank you for watching today. And I'm so happy to have Hog up with us. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. And we'll answer your emails at J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. See you next time.